Good morning. Today it's 56 outside. I'm in Ashland, Oregon, and I came up from LA and I'm up here telling my stories, which I've been telling all over. And people have been telling me, Sam, you should write a book. You should write about these. Even on Facebook, I have people telling me I should write a book about it. So what can I tell you? I got plenty of books back there, but I didn't write well, maybe one or two I did write. I've got, I've got a couple published. At any rate, here's what's happening right now. I'm doing this introduction to my life's stories. I'll be starting, well, I'll be starting with the story about when I was born what I was born into, where I was born, and what resulted from all of that. That will be my first story. And it was in a town about 17 or 18 miles up the Allegheny River from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where I was born. And besides being famous as the aluminum city of America, it was also a mafia town controlled by the boys. And there were two brothers that ran it, and I'll get into all of that when I start with my next version, my next topic, I guess. At any rate, uh, I don't remember whether I said this or not. I don't know why I let my hair grow. I didn't do it on purpose, but it's there. And as I said, I think it was because I, I think I did say this, it was because of my s bladder surgery. I had a couple of cancerous tumors that this doctor removed. She was a lovely lady too. At any rate, uh, what I want to tell you now is some of the topics that I'll be talking about when I tell my stories. I could never tell all of my stories at one time because there isn't enough tape <laughs> don't use tape anymore. However you do it, there isn't enough of it. There isn't enough time in my life, I don't think. So what I have to do is do them in, by topics. So my first one will be about growing up with the Mafia. And then here's some of the things that I've done. Uh, I was a dancer, a hairstylist, bartender, swimming and dancing instructor, smuggler, policeman, prisoner, writer, computer analyst, experiences while in the Army during the Korean War. I have all of those things to tell. And uh, I was a football player, I was a boxer, I was a self-made barber in the Army too. I went out and bought a pair of scissors and clippers and came in and said, anyone want a haircut? <laughs> and I, what I did was I went down and watched how the barbers did it and then I went home, went back to the base and did it that way. So. Anyway, these are some of the things that I did. And so what I'm going to do now is just show you a couple of photographs of some of the people that I dealt with. <coughs> my 
son called me a name dropper, and I'm not going to, uh, well, I have to drop the names, but I'm not trying to impress you. I just want to hook you so that you come back and see some more. All right. This is the front page to the Daily Tidings. I have to peek around it. That's me. And a guy named John Darling interviewed me. And then this is another page. This is on my wall to the right, to the left of me, and it shows all the different celebrities and people that I knew. Some were close to me, like brothers, and others. Well, it's it looks backwards to me. I don't know whether it does to you or not. <laughs> But anyway, that's part of what I did. And then here's some of the photos that I took. And I have stories with each one, so I, oh, and look at the heart coming out of her head. Marlena Dietrich. Yes. I found this photo in a shop down in Hollywood. So I went in and bought it. And then not long after that, why, I found out that a friend of mine was managing her. And so <clears throat> I took the photo and gave it to them. And they, they asked her where where it was taken and when, and she couldn't remember. However, they had 500 of them made for her, and that was Marlena Dietrich. And, and that's the photo right there that I found. Now this photo, oh, how, let's see how, how can we do it without, well, this, is, this one's with light. That, 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 uh, that is Louis Armstrong, and that's his birthday cake. I was standing by it. You can see Louis there talking to the MC. There, there, that's got it. So, and how did that happen? Well, I read about his birthday party, <clears throat> and I just had a feeling that a, a good friend of mine, a sister, was going to be there. And so I went to the backstage entrance and stood there, and sure enough, she came walking up, <clears throat> and she said, Sam, I see you in the damnedest places. What are you doing here? I said, I came to come in with you to hear Louis Armstrong celebrate his birthday. And so she brought me in, and I got that photograph of, I was on stage, off, well, off stage, and I got the cake with Louis standing there with the MC. I don't know who the MC was, but this is who brought me in. Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan was a wonderful lady. She was my sister. I met her through Sir Lionel Beckles. And I have many stories to tell about her, so I'm going to wait that for one of my topics, but <clears throat> I've been with her on many concerts, including the uh, sugar, uh, not the sugar bowl, the, what's that bowl in Hollywood? Anyway, whatever it is called. <laughs> See, I don't remember everything. 
And here's a photo of Miyoshita, Fumio Miyoshita. Fumio is the guy in the center. He's Japanese. And I used to chant with him because he studied uh, the Japanese Nietzsche and Daishonin. And I belonged to a group called NSA in Hollywood. And so when he was leaving to go back, he drove up to Bakersfield where I was working at that time uh, with Buck Owens. And he uh, came to say goodbye. He had his manager with him and he also was flying back to Japan with him. And when he got over there, he recorded numerous records. And one of the things he was famous for was putting people to sleep. His music was that soothing. And if I can find it on my site, I had a lot of trouble with my website and uh, the web host who messed it up pretty badly. But I had it on my site at one time. I don't know if it's there anymore or not. But he played some of his songs on there. And I did a mandala. I drew a mandala, designed it, and then created a mantra from that. And so I could chant or meditate to that. So, anyhow. That's for Fumio. Fumio's passed away now, bless him. But, and he's waiting for me. <laughs> I, I, I keep them waiting, I don't know why. <laughs> and here's Vance Davis. Vance was a buddy of mine. He, we used to have breakfast together and things like that. And he was in a couple of westerns. <laughs> He was in one that was was pornography, and he didn't even know it. And and they didn't they didn't have to shoot him nude or anything, but he was in a cowboy movie that was pornography. <laughs> Good old Vance. <clears throat> and here's Peter Noon. Peter Noon, there, was, oh, I, he was with a very famous rock group, and, and I should know it, but don't. But I represented him when I was working at an agency in Beverly Hills. I was working for an agency in Beverly Hills, <clears throat> and I got him booked in a couple of places and different kind of TV shows and things like that. And here is Sonny Schroyer. Sonny came to see me. He didn't come to see me. He was with Elaine Blythe, who was a good friend of mine. <coughs> I used to work out of her office a lot of times. I set up a computer there, one of the first that was in that building, I'm sure. That was back in the, let's see, I got my first computer in 83, so it had to be sometime after that. <coughs> and so Sonny came to see me, to see a show with Elaine, and I was in it. And afterwards, of course, Elaine introduced me. And S Sonny worked on a, on a show that was on TV, a series, and I can't think of the name of that either. Wait, here I can see it, it's on the back. I could if I had my glasses. Hey, 
he did a couple of movies. Oh, The Dukes of Hazard. The Dukes of Hazard is the one he did. <clears throat> but he, the films that he's done are like The Devil and Max Devlin. They went that away and that away. The Lady and the Lynching, Lincoln Conspiracy, Smokey and the Bandit, Gator, The Farmer, The Longest Yard, Like a Crow on a June Bug, and Payday. So he did a lot of acting, and it was really nice that we became friends. And he was in a play in Beverly Hills, and I went to see that, and he was pretty good. Now, this <clears throat> person I never met. Well, I shouldn't say I never met him. I met him, but I never got to really know him or I wasn't friends with him. It's James Whitmore, and he's playing President Harry Truman. <laughs> yeah, and that's the name of the show, Give Him Hell, Harry. So he... He was one of the guys that came to one of Elaine's shows, and of course I met him and I worked with him. <clears throat> this is Jackie Hilliard. Oh, she and I were brother and sister. Her husband, Bob Hilliard, wrote songs. Our day will come, moonlight gambler, money burns a hole in your pocket. Many, many, many songs. And she was an actress. And one of the things that she told me about was that one day, one time when she was in Mexico City, <laughs> and I'm thinking, Canteen Fluss. Canteen Fluss was at another table, and he wanted to meet her, and she, they got them together. And Canteen Fluss, when he discovered she was a, an actress, told her that if she would come back in six months and make him understand her in Spanish, he would use her in a film. Well, <laughs> Jackie was a go-getter. Oh, what a go-getter. And she, <laughs> I loved her. Yeah. She, she went to uh, the, where the people were from. There, there was an area in New York <clears throat> where the Puerto Ricans lived. And so she went up there and practiced her Spanish with those people. And in six months, she went back, found Cantinflas, and spoke to him in Spanish. And she got the part in Grand Hotel. Now, this isn't the one in English. <coughs> the <coughs> this is one that was done in, uh, in Spanish. That's why I wanted her to speak Spanish. And I've seen it a couple of times. It's really good. It's nice to see her in it. She's since passed away. Most of my friends have passed away. <coughs> um, I'm still hanging out for some reason. So, here's one. <coughs> well, let me show you this one first. This is a photograph I was asked to take for a magazine. And these were the dancers at the Deauville Hotel. <coughs> the girl on this side, her name is Kay Masters. Kay and I became close buddies. That's her again. That's my backyard. <clears throat> so, 
this lady, I introduced myself to her, and I forget the name of the band that was playing, but one of those big bands, and I just liked her so much I went up and talked to her. <laughs> and you can see I'm pleasing her. Oh, that was me, by the way. I looked a little younger then. <coughs> Here's another picture of Seth, Sarah Vaughan. Oh, she was so good. <coughs> and then this was a fellow that I met while my wife was trying out for different talent shows. This was Tori Winters. Winter. Was it Winters or Winters? Winters. Winter. Tori Winter. I talked to Tori just the other day on the phone. He's in uh, Florida. And here's another picture of him. He knew Bob Marley. He was from Jamaica. And so he knew Bob Marley. <clears throat> and when he was interviewed, they took one of these photos and was put into a magazine somewhere. <coughs> well, this is Billy D. Williams at the top. And over here is Maria de Aragon, who was Greedo. I forget what he played, but he was, he was in a couple of those Star Wars. And I was booking Maria, we, we were close friends, and I booked her in a lot of different autograph signings. And uh, we went to Omaha, Nebraska one time. If you're ever in Omaha, you might ask him about it. And she did that. <coughs> I had a friend who told me, or he asked me, he asked me if I, or what I thought would be the next musical era, what kind of music would it be? And I said, well, I think maybe the Western music will come back, country Western. Because it had been a while since that had really been out there. It was still playing in places like Bakersfield and places like that, but it wasn't really out. And so he said, well, <coughs> <coughs> he, he was a musician. So he said, well, I've written a country western song. And so I asked if I could hear it. And so he had a recording of it and he played it. And I said, uh, What about the lyrics? He said he didn't have lyrics. So I said, would you let me write the lyrics? Because I love to write. And he said, sure. So I wrote the lyrics. And this is a song. It was called, Texas is Where I Want to Be. Have you ever thought of where you're going? Ever thought of where you want to be? Well, I don't have to think about that question because Texas is where I want to be. <laughs> Anyhow, that's where my son is right now, is in Texas. Arlington, Texas. Not Arlington, Virginia but Arlington, Texas. This is a stage where I produced my first play called Cancel Christmas. <clears throat> and here is Woody Allen. I took these photos while he was on stage. 
I have stories about all these people, but I'm not going to, I'm going to let you guys get on your way. However, I have just a few more here. This is the light, a group called The Lighthouse. And this is their rehearsal area. I was flown up to uh, Toronto, Canada, where they were playing, and and I, it was by I think it was RCA Records. Anyhow, <coughs> I went up there and photographed them, and then came back to New, to uh, New, New York, where I was living, and a little while later they came to New York. And they were playing in Carnegie Hall. <coughs> so these are shots. It's hard to see, but these are shots that I took of them on stage at Carnegie Hall. <coughs> this is a group called Sparky, and that's my son. I don't know, on this side, that's Tori. <coughs> and I took him to an audition. I got a lady to work with him, and uh, he got the part. And there's a long story about that, which I'll tell sometime. This is a picture of Duchess. That's Duchess. And this was like the, th this was on location. This was my friend. He was like a brother to me. And this fella was like the uh, s Western stars of today, oh, not of today, of that era when I went to see him. And there's Duchess, she's just scratching. She usually liked to pose. <coughs> That's me with the pipe. Oh, I think we all had pipes, but Edgar Casey. I'm, I'm next to Einstein. And there's Jean Burnett. Gene played music in between while I talked. That was to give the people a break. <laughs> this was another good friend of mine. Ike Turner. It was Ike and Tina. I uh, used to. Well, I drove limo and uh, was the artist relations for a couple of theaters. And so I would pick them up, drive them. <coughs> One time, I have to tell this story right now. I had Johnny Carson on the list for the next show. <coughs> and it was at the Valley Music Theater out in Woodland Hills. Well, I had a limo that was a uh, Rolls-Royce Phantom 5 and I was having it repaired at the time and so I didn't have a car to pick up Johnny Carson. So I knew Ed Brown who was uh, Don Ho's manager from Hawaii and I'd been up to his house many times and he had a number of limos. So I called him and asked him if he would loan me one of his limos for Johnny Carson. So he said, sure, come on up. Well, what he g loaned me was a beautiful Mercedes limousine. It was like riding on a flat, calm lake on a speedboat. It was so comfortable. <coughs> well, when I went to pick Johnny Carson up, I, you know, went up, knocked on the door, and he came out, 
said goodbye to his wife, I think. At, at any rate, uh, <laughs> he, he uh, got out to the car, and when he saw it, he said, Wow, that's a beauty. And he said, Could I drive it? Who's going to say no to Johnny Carson? I'd been on his show, not on his show, but I'd been at his show numerous times, and I'd met him, so it wasn't like we didn't know each other. <coughs> but, so I, <laughs> I said, sure. Well, when we, <coughs> when we got to the theater and pulled in, the guards almost flipped out. I wasn't driving. Johnny was driving. And for the ten days he was there, he chauffeured me back and forth. I never drove him once. But I don't know that there are many people can say Johnny Carson chauffeured me to the theater, because he did. And I sat up in front with him, of course. I would sit in the back. <laughs> Anyhow, there's other stories about Johnny Carson that I've been in with different people like uh, uh, Shelley Winters, and Monty Rock, and a few people. But anyhow, I'll save that for a special time, like a Johnny Carson program. Here is Miss Chinatown. 1962, I came to San Francisco in 1961. Well, it was November, so went to 61. <clears throat> and I stayed six months. I only intended, intended to stay two weeks. But I went up to the Mapes in Reno because the Vagabonds were playing there, who were friends of mine, and uh, <laughs> I gambled all my money away. So when I got back to San Francisco, I still had the hotel and everything. And so I went the next morning, walked right down and got a job in a camera store right away because I'd been doing photography in the past, so that's... I've done a number of things. I think I mentioned that. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, I worked in the in the camera shop, the camera store, Brooks Camera, was called. And uh, I stayed for six months. In that time, I met a nice Chinese lady, who became my friend. And when it came time for the Chinese New Year's. Why, uh, she had me, uh, or she got me into the theater to photograph. So I had my camera and a strobe light, <coughs> which is what we used a lot then. And uh, we all huddled downstairs in front of the stage. After that show, I no longer wanted to tell anyone I was a photographer. They weren't nice people. Anyhow, I wasn't so nice either. What I did was, when they said, okay, you can get up on stage and take pictures now, that was after she was crowned and everything. I went behind her, behind her, and I focused on all of the guys there with their cameras getting ready to take a picture, and I popped off a shot with my strobe that blinded them all. Then I just walked around and got this shot and left. 
<laughs> Somewhere I have another shot of, of uh, I don't think I have it with me. But it was uh, a, a good, a good shot. I think it was. They look all happy and everything there. At any rate, then here's <laughs> Red Fox. You remember Red? Oh, he was a great guy. He, when he was, he played at the theater, the Circle Star up in San Francisco, and I was working the artist relations there. <clears throat> and he was so much fun. I had a friend that was working in one of the clubs. He was like, he played the guitar and sang. And he entertained people. And I took uh, Red there to see him. Then I had another story about Red at, at uh, an anniversary thing that he had in L.A. And uh, uh, I'm going to save that one for later. Here's a dear friend of mine. She was upstairs in the roof where I was living in Glendale, California. And so it got so hot up in the roof that she had to take the babies out and take them somewhere else. And so she was crossing with the babies. And so I waited until she came down with the baby and I took her picture. And she looked at me and said, if it comes out, I want three five by sevens. <laughs> Here is Miss Universe. I think it's 1960. I'm not sure now. But her name was Linda Beeman. And I have another picture where I'm in a swimming suit and she's in one and we're posing and I'm holding her hand and I don't know where that one is. If I find it, I'll put it on the, one of those. <clears throat> this is just what it says, Havana, Cuba. I was in Havana, Cuba in 1959 and there's verification. I don't know if you can see it or not, but I was with Tony and Mrs. Keating. Tony was a dance instructor at the hotel where I had the photography concession. And there's a whole story behind that. It's a fun story. Now tell it one day. This is one of the last productions that I was in called Cats. And I was Gus the theater cat, an old cat. And I had a part where I sang and I was doing vocalizations with a, a vocal coach and the conductor was a wonderful guy and they were very patient with me because when we would practice and I do the vocals I sang and I would sing out the way that I had learned to do. And then when I'd get on stage, I took on the part of Gus, the old theater cat who was shaking. His hands were shaking like this. And he just was old and didn't have a great voice anymore. <laughs> like what I'm doing right now. And 
he uh, was just mouthing the words. I, that's how I felt that he would do it. He, he did a little singing, but not that much singing. And it was a little frustrating for Les, was his name, the, the conductor for the Ukiah Light Symphony, no, for the Ukiah Civic Light Opera. And uh, so he put up with me, and so did the lady. We did our vocal exercises in the back, and then when I went on stage, I changed and became old theater cat. And the, even the kids that were on stage told me that I made them cry every night. So and many people in the audience were crying. So I was doing the right thing. Now, here is a friend of mine. He was another brother. Name is Jerry Brando. Jerry Brando was a buddy of mine. I last saw Jerry, I went to visit him when he was living in uh, Las Vegas, and I went up to see him, and we went to uh, a couple of concerts and things together, and he since has passed away, but he was great. And he was the one that told me I had a, a hernia, and he said I should get it taken care of and it wouldn't take long. Well, I ended up with a lap. There I go with my stories. Uh, I, I'll tell that one again someday. But the, the, I took that picture so that it would get in this, for this magazine. And we were outside when I did it, so there'd be, the background would be dark, and then just a light on him. Well, now, this picture. <laughs> did I save these for last? I can't believe I did. That's me. That's me. That's me. And this is me and my son. We were in a movie and we were deputies. But that's Tori, my son. So, folks, that wraps it up. Uh, I'm going to tell... Oh, it didn't wrap it up. I found another picture. That's Betty Riley. I took this one for a magazine for them. And this is the picture in the magazine. And I had the photography concession at that hotel. And I did a lot of publicity. And I have a lot of pictures, uh, like with Bob Hope, different people. So these are things that I will share with you if you want to hear it or want to see it. If, if it's just too much, I understand. I don't know how I could listen to me go on and on and on and on and on and on. So, until the next time, which will be the reading about reading, not reading. I'm not going to read it. I won't do that. I refuse to read because it just takes away from what it is. I will have some notes because I may not remember, but I don't intend to read it. 
so uh, I'll just tell you one thing. This is why I have notes. <laughs> Until the next time, which will be when I start out at five being involved with the Mafia. That's right, five. Five years old. Four or five, I don't know. Anyhow, that's it. Thank you very much.